You are about to step into a brave new world of power, performance, and productivity made possible by the new Commodore Amiga 500 home computer. Sit back and get set for the ride of your life. Oh yes, the Amiga 500. One of the most loved home computers of all time. And for good reason. More than 1,700 games were released for the Amiga. This machine had great graphics and sound capabilities and an unbeatable price of around $700 in 1987. Compare that to the competition at the time. On the PC, EGA and CGA were still the norm and VGA had just been invented. But before mid-1988 you could only get its glorious new graphics modes if you bought an IBM PS2, starting somewhere in the $3000 range. But even in 1988 a VGA card would have cost you something like $400 to $500. That's almost the price of the Amiga. You would get more colors for the price, but you'd still be lacking most of the hardware accelerated graphics the Amiga provided. And sound? The Sound Blaster was not yet invented. You could probably get an Adlib card that gave you FM synthesis, but it would set you back another $200. Or you could get a Roland MT32 synthesizer, which gave you great music, but cost around $700. $100 more than the whole Amiga computer. Other than that, you'd only get PC speaker sounds, one channel square wave at one bit resolution. At the same time, the Amiga was already capable of playing four hardware mixed channels of 8 bit sampled audio at 28 kHz and that all for one third of the price of a decent PC clone of similar performance. I am 512,000 bytes of pure power. In the Apple world there was the Macintosh 2, but it cost around $6,000. Or the Mac SE, which lacked color graphics and was still about $3,000. The only relevant competition probably came from the Atari ST, which didn't have quite the graphics and audio capabilities of the Amiga, but had a price in about the same ballpark and was considered more of a professional machine. I refurbished an Atari 1040 STF a while ago and made a video about it, go see it if you haven't already. This all made the Amiga 500 gain popularity quickly and people who loved it back in the day still love it today. Well, this computer is a true legend and I finally bought one. My Amiga doesn't look legendary at all anymore though. I got it really cheap from eBay and the seller did say they didn't know whether it even worked. And it came without a power supply, mouse, video cable or even workbench floppies. So basically I have nothing to test this with. It's really dirty too and I have no idea yet what it looks like on the inside, so let's find out. There is a small note taped to the top of the case. Apparently the mouse was lost for a longer period of time because this is how the keyboard can be used as a mouse replacement. Speaking of the keyboard, I have no idea what's going on with the numpad. I hope that's wax in there and nothing worse. Now let's open the case and take a look inside. It's really easy in the Amiga, just a bunch of Torx head screws and that's it. do we find? More dirt and some corrosion on the RF shield. Let's hope there isn't more corrosion on the mainboard or some other electronic components. Only one way to find out and that is to remove the RF shield and take a closer look. Taking out the keyboard first is easy, just unplug it and you're done. To open the RF shield we need to remove these four screws, then we can take the top part off after straightening the metal clips. Done. Now from the inside this Amiga doesn't really look that bad. It's pretty dusty, but I didn't find any corrosion or other damage and even the electrolytic capacitors look alright. I want to take the mainboard out completely so that I can take a look at the bottom and also to clean the case thoroughly. To do that I first have to remove the floppy drive. It's just one screw on the inside, three on the bottom and we can take it out. The final step is to unscrew all the connectors from the shielding. I don't have one of those hex screwdrivers, but a pair of pliers works just as well. Hey. 
As I said, the board looks pretty good all in all, but I still want to get rid of some of the dust and dirt before trying to boot it up for the first time. To do that, I'm using some compressed air, some alcohol and a toothbrush. Nothing super surprising here, I guess. My Amiga came without any cables, so I have to come up with a different way to test it. I decided to use a cheap VGA cable for now and solder it directly onto the video connector's pins. Later I'll turn that into a real cable with an appropriate plug, but for testing this should be good enough. We only need the red, green and blue signals, vertical and horizontal sync signals and the ground wire. Six wires all in all, that's not too much work. To make sure the cable shielding or ground wire don't cause any short circuits, I cover them with some tape. Even though I didn't get any power supply with the computer, I was able to borrow one from a friend. He said he hasn't used it in ages, so I ran a quick check on the voltages to make sure they are what they should be, and in fact they all look fine and dandy. Okay, security checks complete, let's do the smoke test. Oh shit! Okay, that was a bad joke and I should feel bad. In fact, uh, the Amiga works perfectly fine. Since I don't have any workbench floppies for the machine and no way to create them on any of my other computers, I had to come up with a different solution to actually boot it. I bought this GoTech floppy drive emulator quite some time ago and wanted to use it on one of my retro PCs, but I decided to go with regular floppies there instead. So this thing can emulate a floppy drive using images from a USB thumb drive, but in order to use it I'll have to install a firmware on it that understands how to deal with Amiga floppy images and how to talk to the Amiga. There are several firmware versions available for it that can do exactly that, like the HXC one, but I decided to go with the Cortex Amiga one, made and published for free by Hervé Messenger, I hope I pronounced this name correctly. Um, to install the firmware we'll first have to open the drive's case and solder a few pins onto the PCB that we need for programming. We need to be able to boot the device into the bootloader's programming mode and also to communicate with it using a serial connection. These wires are for the LC display on the front that shows the number of the currently selected floppy image and also for the two push buttons that allow selecting the image. I have an old um, AVR programmer. Um, it has one part that I'm really interested in, and that is the FTDI uh, USB UART. It is then connected to this microcontroller through these optocouplers, but we're not interested in that. So what we really want is the um, TTL UART signals that are coming from these two pins, if I'm not mistaken. And in order to prevent the, UR, uh, the, the um, microcontroller from interfering with that, I'm going to desolder these two optocouplers. And by doing so, we should be able to um, tap into these two pins and use that to program the GoTech drive. Another strange thing, this programmer has actually a USB-A connector here, but it's supposed to be used as a device, a USB device. So um, I once had a cable for that. I have no idea where it went, but I guess I will just solder a USB cable directly onto these pins of the connector. have an old uh, USB cable. It's from a an old phone. Um, I already removed um, the proprietary connector it had on there. 
I will now strip off more of the insulation and then solder it onto the um, connector there and see if that works. I already stripped the wires and now I'm putting some solder onto them. Before trying to solder anything to the old pins, I put some fresh solder there to make it easier to work with them. Just a quick check to see if the USB connection works and the FTDI chip is detected by my operating system and it actually is. So we can now finish the preparation for the drive and install the new firmware. The project's website only describes how to flash it using Windows, so we'll have to experiment a bit here to get it working on Linux, but that shouldn't be any problem at all. I've already downloaded um, first the STM serial flash tool, um, which I'm going to compile now and then see if it works. Uh, just a make file. Does it work? Seems so. Let's be bold and just install it. That was a typo. It's not so easy to type when you have the camera uh, and the microphone in your way. Anyway, okay, so that's the tool. Seems to run. Now let's unzip the Cortex Amiga floppy emulator firmware. And what do we have here? Okay, so we basically just have the hex file and that's it. So let's plug in the newly made UART transceiver uh, into our GoTech drive and see if that works. I have um, soldered the USB cable onto the pins for the USB connector because I didn't have this um, type of cable that has a USB-A plug on both ends. Um, then I stole the RX and TX lines from the FTDI chip so that we can actually um, communicate with the STM chip on the GoTech drive. And I also stole some um, 5 volts and ground that I will use to power the GoTech drive through the uh, programmer now. So let's set this stuff up. first. We need a jumper to set the uh, bootloader on this thing to programming mode. Then we need to add the communication lines. Um, this thing has RX on the right, so we have to put TX there. So, and all that is missing is to add the 5 volts. Bam! And we should be ready and, and go good to go to flash the drive, and that's what I'm going to try now. Let's see. Yeah, it's showing up. That means we should have a virtual serial port now, and we should be able to flash this firmware. Let's see. Let's first just run a test that should work like this. And yeah, that looks okay, I guess. And now let's find the command line to flash the file. Okay, so that should basically be just this. And let's see what happens. Fail to erase. Hmm, let's disable write protection, maybe. Done. And let's try rewriting. Uh, there. Oh, that looks better. Cool. That's flashing our firmware into the GoTech drive. And once that's done, we should be able to use the drive on our Amiga. Done. Okay, um, I don't know, is there a verification step possible somehow? Verify. Oh, verify, right, it's too late. Should have passed that as an option before. Who cares? Um, I'll not enable the write protection again yet. Let's first see how that works. Okay, with that out of the way, I guess we can now unplug all the programming equipment and remove the um, bootloader uh, programming pin. And one more thing we have to do, we have to 
set this drive to drive ID 0 because we want to boot from it. And that's only possible on the Amiga if we set it to drive 0, at least with the old Kick-ROM version that I have so far. I think that doesn't support uh, selecting the boot drive. So um, now I can basically just put that back into the uh, original case, or at least uh, at some of the parts, mostly the um, bottom of the enclosure. And why does it not fit anymore? What am I doing wrong? There we go. So, and then I can also reinstall the buttons and the LCD. And that should be all that we need to do. Now we can hook it up to the Amiga and see what happens. Let's plug in the cables on the drive. And on the mainboard too, of course. I've already copied the selector disk image that is needed to configure the drive's firmware and the version of Workbench that fits to my Kickrom version onto this USB stick. Powering up the Amiga now and it takes us right into the firmware setup tool. Here I can assign disk images to slots, which I can then select using the buttons on the drive. Selector.adf is the disk image that contains this tool and it's always in slot 0. I will now assign Workbench 1.3 to slot 1 and reboot. And there we go, Workbench is running, 362,912 bytes free. I can move the mouse cursor by holding down the Amiga key and pressing the cursor keys, but as it turns out I cannot click anything, at least the left Amiga and Alt keys don't work. I'll investigate that problem next, but at least this drive emulator seems to work. And that's it for part 1 of my Amiga refurbishment project. There are 3 more parts to come in the next 3 weeks. In part 2 we'll investigate what's wrong with the keyboard and do a lot of cleaning on the machine. So come back if that's your kind of thing. Thank you so much for watching and if you like this video why don't you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. While you're at it you might also want to consider following me on Twitter as well. There I post about my retro projects and that might give you a hint about upcoming videos. But for now, bye and until next time.